Now, if you have not been here for the last several months, we are in a series through the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is the fourth gospel, we often call it. It's a little bit different than the first three. The first three are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is uh, a little bit of a different style. It's one of the uh, disciples of Jesus writing and giving us uh, uh, a, a unbelievable teaching for a purpose. And that purpose is so that we will have life in his name. And that, that's stated clearly by John himself. I always love it when a conversation begins like that, don't you? Like, hey, we need to talk, and here's what we're going to talk about, and here's the hope that I have from this conversation. Hopefully it's good, but sometimes that's bad. Like, hey, I got, I got beef with you, buddy, and I'm hoping that, that I can fix this or get this out. That's, that's a good way to have a conversation. Well, John is having a conversation, if you will, in writing this book, and he tells us in John chapter 20, verse 31. If you haven't already highlighted that verse in your Bible, you ought to, because it is the, the, the hinge upon which the entire book of John swings. And it's this, that these were written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Like we want to see him for who he is. And John says it's so that you will see him for who he is, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And then that by believing you may have life in his name, eternal life, abundant life, holy life, God honoring, glorifying life. So the purpose of this study is so that people far from God who are separated from him by sin might come to believe in Jesus and find life in his name. So my prayer for you is that if you don't know Jesus, if you don't have life in his name, if you are still searching for hope and everlasting life and you're not positive about where you stand with God, is that through this study and especially even through this sermon today, you would find uh, life in his name by believing in the son of God. That would be great. The other thing is that so that people who already believe in Jesus, so those of you who are saved, who have become Christians and you have life, that you would come into fullness of that life, that, that you would grow in submission and obedience to the name of Jesus and that you might fully appreciate, celebrate, and look to Jesus as the source of your spiritual life. And that is exactly what's happening in John chapter 3. It is the account of a man named Nicodemus coming to Jesus, trying to get more information about some things that he was teaching. Now, everywhere I have lived and every community I have ever been a part of has kind of a cultural rite of passage. Maybe maybe you know what I'm talking about. Maybe you've experienced. And, And what I mean is this. We say things like this, well, you're not truly one of us unless you have, and and then we fill in the blank or something that you're supposed to do or uh, somewhere where you've gone that confirms that you are one of us. Like for instance, you're really not one of us unless you've stacked chairs here at Christ Church Queen Creek. Can I get an amen right there? Like if you stack chairs, all right, you're in. Come on, it's a rite of passage. If you have not, then, you know, welcome to the family, but you're on the outside looking in. I remember when I, again, I've said this a thousand times. Somebody will make fun of me, I'm sure, again. But I remember in Colorado, I wasn't a Colorado until I did something. I hunted and killed my first animal. It was like, oh, okay, all right, cool, you're one of us now. Like, you killed a deer, great, let's go. Or in Vegas, we know that you're not one of us if you say Nevada. Like, it's not Nevada, it's Nevada, all right? We know you're not one of us, so that's kind of a rite of passage. In Arizona, it might be that you're not a real Arizonan unless you've been to the Grand Canyon, which probably excise out half of you because I've realized some of you haven't even been to the Grand Canyon yet. And that just kind of is what makes you an Arizonan, I think. It's got to. When somebody moves to the valley and I ask them, hey, when did you get here? And they say, oh, a few months ago. And I'm like, oh, you haven't been through our summer yet. (laughs) Okay. We'll see if you're still here after August. And if you are, then you're one of us. Welcome to the family. This is literally what Jesus is teaching in John chapter 3, about being a Christian. You see, a lot of people think that they are Christians. And and they think that they are because they claim, well, I'm a Christian. I go to a Christian church. I grew up in a Christian home. This is a Christian nation. I'm not Buddhist. I'm not Muslim. I'm Christian. But what John teaches us through the interaction of Jesus and Nicodemus is that being a Christian is a little bit more than that. And I want you to see that. And then I'm going to show you the big idea that supports that. Look at John chapter 3, verse 1. It says this. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, 
a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. Then Jesus answered him. Did you, did you pick up a question? I didn't pick up a question, but Jesus answered him. I love that. We're going to come back to that, but great. And he says this, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So, so, so here's what Jesus is saying. If I could say it in a way that would package it for you to take home and dwell on this afternoon is this. Big idea. Write it down. Ready? All true Christians are born again Christians. All true Christians are born again Christians. Born again has an interesting stigma in our culture, doesn't it? That phrase, born again. People have hijacked the word to describe anything that has been restored, like a house or an antique. Like antiques aren't born again. They're just old and they're cleaned, right? They're, they're not born again, but they've been using that word. Others have made that word into somewhat of an insult. Oh, they refer to people as, oh, you're one of those, you're, you're one of those born again Christians, like holier than thou, born again, right? Like, like it's used almost with that, that stigma or an insult. However, I just want you to settle in today to the reality that the idea of being born again is thoroughly biblical, and it was used by Jesus to describe something that has happened to everyone who is a true Christian. If you have not been born again, then you are not a true Christian. True Christianity doesn't come by profession. True Christianity doesn't come by association. True Christianity doesn't come by family lineage. True Christianity comes by being born again. So according to Jesus, if you have not been born again, then you are not a true Christian. That's a challenging reality that Jesus is pointing out to us, and it should bring us to ask one question. Have I been born again? Like, that's the obvious question. We all should sit here in a service like this, studying a passage like this, and we should say, is that me? Is that my story? Is that my testimony? Is this what's happened to me? Now, I want you to consider this with me, and I think there are three, three characteristics, if you will, of what it means to be born again. And I want, you to, I want you to have them. I want you to write them down. I want you to remember them because these are things that if you are to be born again or if you are born again, you have these three things true about your Christianity. You ready? So here's how we're going to do it. I have been born again if, number one, I recognize the sinner's problem. I recognize the sinner's problem. Now, verse one tells us that Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was a very important religious leader in the Jewish religion. He was a ruler of the Jews. And as a Pharisee, he would have been an extremely devout and proud group of people. He would have been meticulous at trying to keep the law of Moses. He had seen the signs. He even says that. We've seen the signs that you're doing. And so we know that you must be of God. Just like at the end of chapter 2, many people superficially believed on Jesus because of the signs that he had done. So here's Nicodemus, one of those men who had this superficial, shallow faith, comes to Jesus. He needed to know more about Jesus. So under the cover of night, I think, afraid to expose that he was actually coming to Jesus for fear of judgment from his fellow bros in the Pharisee tribe, he needed to know more about Jesus. So he's coming to him to ask some questions. Nicodemus calls him rabbi. That's an interesting thing. It means teacher. It was a term of great respect. It was especially a term of great respect coming from a Pharisee who was a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling body, and this man was a Galilean. So here is the, 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 the Harvard graduate of the day, if you will, coming to the community college dropout in their mind, and he calls him teacher, rabbi, I'm here to learn from you. Teach me something. I mean, I've got some questions. And by the way, listen, coming to Jesus to ask some questions and learn more about him is not what saves a person. It's a great place to start, but it's not what saves a person. And he came to Jesus in a posture as a student, trying to learn more of Jesus in calling him rabbi and recognizing him as a great teacher. His heart was, 
There's something I need more. I mean, I know all of this, but I think I need more. Like if I could learn more religion or more about the law or more about the kingdom, I think I could get there. I think I could get there. I think I'm a pretty good dude. I'm of the right lineage. I've gone to the right schools and this guy's pretty smart. He's obviously sent of God. So teach me more. Give me more religion. Give me more instruction because if I get that, I think I'll get there. It was obvious that Nicodemus was not able to recognize what his real problem was. So Jesus answered the real problem. No question. But Jesus knew what was going on. Jesus answers questions you think, not ask. And that's what was happening. And so Jesus says to him, truly, truly, I say to you. He pretty much ignored all that he was saying and he shot straight to the heart of the issue. Nicodemus had not even stated the question. And he now was going to tell him what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God, which means to have eternal life which means to go to heaven. We say that a lot. Go to heaven when you die. Have everlasting life with God in eternity. That's what Nicodemus wanted. And Jesus was gonna answer that. And here's what he says. You ready? You want eternal life? You wanna see the kingdom of God? You must be, say it with me, what? Born again. Born again. So what does that mean? It's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. I'm prepared to answer that. So good question. To be born again meant that what Nicodemus and all people need is a complete and total transformation, new life, complete new birth. The point that Jesus wanted to hammer down to Nicodemus is is this. Nick, you don't need further instruction in religion. You, You need to be born again. You don't need to be a more moral person and keep the the law better. You need to see yourself as a sinner who isn't born into the right family, who isn't part of the right religion, who's not this by association. You need to see something that's not about religious improvement. You need nothing less than new life that comes from God. Born again, born from above could also be the understanding. New birth, being born again is an act whereby God gives eternal life or imparts eternal life to the person who believes in him. And I just, I just want to pull over for a second here and say, if you're here today because you thought, well, I need a new church because the old church I went to wasn't doing it for me and I just need to get new laws and new regulations and new understanding and I need to get a little bit better. Teach me to be a better moral person. Teach me how to, how to do church better. Teach me what I can add to what I've already gotten. Can I tell you, none of that is going to save you. You will not see the kingdom of God if you don't have new life that comes to the power of God and be born again. The problem is this, that every person needs to recognize that they will never be good enough, moral enough, religious enough, honorable enough, smart enough, of noble birth enough, or enough of any other thing in order to be saved and enter into the kingdom of God. You can't give enough. You can't pray enough. You can't serve enough. You can't sing loud enough. Raise your hands high enough. Get on your tippy toes high enough. You can't do any of that. It only comes through being born again. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And apart from total new birth, transformation will never have any hope of eternal life in God's kingdom. Listen, it comes not by reformation. You don't need to reform your actions. Hey, maybe, maybe I'll get to heaven if I just do better. No, it's not by reformation. It's not by confirmation. Maybe I'll get to heaven if I'm just more like these people. Please don't be more like these people or more like me. Confirmation never saves you. Or confirmation. Confirmation may just be, yeah, I agree with that truth. That doesn't save you. What saves you and gives you eternal life is transformation through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ that gives you new birth. That's what he's saying. So you want to have born again? You want to be born again? You want to have true Christianity? It's this. It's being in Christ, a new life that comes only through him. An honest and humble recognition of your problem. So first, recognize, I can't do it. I can't be good enough. I can't come to him enough and be taught enough. I can't call him rabbi enough. I can't be part of the Jewish system enough. I can't do it. That's your first step to being born again. I must recognize the sinner's problem. All true Christians are born again Christians, and the first characteristic of a born again Christian is that they have recognized 
the sinner's problem. But secondly, I want you to see what he says here. I have been born again if I experience the Spirit's power. I experience the Spirit's power. Now look at this, verse four. Nicodemus looks at him and says, born again, how can this be? How can a man be born when he is old? That's a good question. Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Like, it's almost laughable, isn't it? I don't know what the posture of Nicodemus was here, but I think he was like, come on, Jesus, like, give me a break here. What you're asking for is humanly impossible. That's right. You're, You're making the entrance into the kingdom contingent on something that could not be obtained through human effort. So Jesus answers this question. He answers this debate. Verse five, Jesus answered him, truly, truly. That's the second time he uses that phrase. What he's saying is, I'm declaring to you truth. I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now what Jesus means by being born again was that a person must be born of water and the spirit. Now, water and spirit were Jesus' two words used to describe new birth. To be born again meant that you were born of water and spirit. The symbolism that he's using of water and spirit should have immediately been recognized by Nicodemus as a picture of spiritual cleansing and renewal. Now, we don't turn far in our Bibles often, but I have to have you do this for me. And I want you to go with me to Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel is an Old Testament prophet. If you open to the middle of your Bible, you find Psalms, turn right, a few books, and you'll get to Ezekiel chapter 36. Let's turn those pages real quick and get there. I need you to see this because this is what Ezekiel should have immediately thought of when he heard the phrase water and spirit. Verse, verse 34, uh, verse 24, rather, of Ezekiel 36. Actually, look at verse 20, uh, 25. Here's what he's saying, a promise to the nation of Israel. Get this, don't miss this, it's so good. Like, I can tell, I'm, I know that we're risking it not being grasped because it's so powerful. Here's what it is. Jesus, or God, through Ezekiel, is making a promise to his people. And he says this, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and here it is and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. So so if if you don't grasp it at first read, here's what Ezekiel is doing. He is predicting a time when God would cleanse his people from their sins, give them a new heart and new spirit and put his spirit within them so that they would walk in obedience to his word. The promise of Ezekiel was fulfilled in Jesus when he established the new covenant with his blood and then sent the Holy Spirit to dwell in all who believe in him. So what Christ is saying to Nicodemus was that the new birth that he was talking about did not come through physical actions or physical religion, but through spiritual washing of the soul which is a cleansing accomplished only by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God does this work, is what he's saying. If you need a cross-reference later, read Titus 3, 5. It says that we have been saved not of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. What he's saying is this. The work that produces this kind of new birth isn't white knuckle religion. It isn't a list of do's and don'ts. It's not following the Mishnah that the Pharisees have set up. It's not looking at the rules of a legalistic religion. It is the power of the Spirit of God cleansing you from your sin 
indwelling you and giving you new life. That which is spiritual only comes through the spirit. That which is flesh is born of the flesh. In fact, that's what verse six says. That which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And then he looks at Nicodemus. I think Nicodemus is like, what are you talking about? Like some of you are right now. You're like, what, 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 what am I missing here? No, you're not. You're looking good. He says this, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Don't, don't be shocked by this. Nicodemus, you should know the heart of man is wicked and horrible and sinful. You should know that religion has never fulfilled you and all of your Old Testament studies has never done anything for you. Don't marvel at what I said to you that you must be born again. And then he makes this statement in verse eight. Let's, let's just put our hats on for a second. In verse eight, he further shows how this new birth is accomplished through the power of the work of the spirit. I think they're in the, I imagine them doing this. Listen, they're on the, they're on the rooftop. If you've seen the Chosen series, you know that's where he put him, was up on the rooftop, right? He's on the rooftop, and I think the wind was blowing, kind of the coolness of the evening. And Jesus says this to him, Nicodemus, look, the wind blows where it wishes. Feel that? It blows where it wishes. You hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. You know it's here because you hear it, you feel it, but you don't know what's all happening. You don't know, you don't know when it's coming or how it's coming or where it's coming from. And so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. What's his point? His point is this. Man does not control the wind. It goes where it wants. He is only aware of its presence by what it does. He can hear it. He can feel it. He can see it moving things. He can tell which way it is blowing. But man cannot explain it or control it. Now, this is powerful to a man who had controlled his salvation his entire life who had been good enough his entire life, and now he is saying, no, what you need is not being good enough. What you need is new birth, and that new birth comes only through the power of the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God does what he wants, when he wants, how he wants, because being born again is a work of the power of the Spirit of God in our lives. He moves as he desires, and man can only sense the result of the Spirit's work. It's the Spirit's sovereign work of regeneration and bringing cleansing and new birth in the human heart can never be controlled nor predicted, yet its effects can be seen in the transformed lives of those who are born of the Spirit. That's what he's saying. He's saying, look, Nicodemus, I know you're trying to understand this. I know you're trying to figure out how to control the wind. You can't control the wind. You were brought up in a system that believed you could be good enough, that you could save yourself according to obedience to the Mosaic law and all the traditions of the elders. You think you could follow the fundamentals and be good enough. And I just want you to know that you are a dead man. You are like the dead bones we just sung about in Ezekiel 37, dried up in a valley and the spirit of God moved across you and made the muscles grow again and the flesh grow again and brought new life. That's what happens when you are born again. Listen, let me illustrate it this way. I remember when I got saved, I was 13 years old. I was a punk. Like you think I'm a punk now. Yeah, you do. You didn't know me when I was 13, pre-Jesus. Mom, mom says to me, Andy, I want you to go to, she calls me Andy. My mom and Angela call me Andy. If you call me Andy, we're fighting. We're having one of those conversations, all right? No, I'm just kidding. But she says to me, Andy, we're, you're going to, I want you to go to teen camp, student camp, summer in Flagstaff, Arizona. I'm like, I don't want to go to teen camp. That's stupid. I'm playing baseball, I'm 13, because obviously 13-year-olds have a baseball career, and I'm, it's important for me to set some things in place, so I don't really want to go to camp. And really what was happening, she didn't know inside of me, the Spirit of God was doing something. The Spirit of God was squeezing me and, and, and challenging me and exposing me to the reality that I was lost and broken. He was moving across my life. And I knew that if I went to teen camp, that something crazy was going to happen. That some guy was going to get up like I'm doing right now and he's going to say, you must be born again. And I'm going to say, I agree with you. And then I'm going to have to do it. And I didn't want to do that. The Spirit of God was pressing on me and squeezing on me and, and challenging me. But she said something to me. She said, if you go and don't like it, you never have to go again. I said, oh, I got this. I got a week. I got a week. I can handle a week of this stuff. All I have to do is say no for 
five days, and then I come home and say, Mom, I hated it. It was horrible. I don't ever want to go back. I never have to go back again. But guess what? The Spirit of God was moving and working, and the, the wind of God was moving across. I didn't expect it at 13. I didn't ask him to do it to me at 13. In fact, I tried to stop the wind at 13. And on Tuesday morning, I have this little sheet of paper on my desk that reminds me the date and time I was in a sermon, and sure enough, this guy got up and said, you must be born again, and I said, you're right, and then I came up in an invitation type of thing, and I prayed with this guy named Jimmy Sparrow, and I don't know that he knew even what to say, because he didn't say much, he just said, hey, I think you know what to pray, and I'm like, you're right, I do know what to pray, and I just called out to Jesus Christ on the, the, the side of the worship center stage there at that chapel up in Flagstaff, Arizona, at the base of Mount Eldon right next to this massive pine tree. I called on the name of Jesus and I did that. I did that because the spirit of God was doing something in my life. It wasn't my will. I didn't wake up one day and say, it's time for me to seek the Lord. It was the spirit of God that came in and said, Andrew, you are lost and you are broken and your Baptist background and your religious attitude or your commitment to worldly things is never going to fill you. And the spirit of God moved in a way that I cannot explain, that I cannot un understand fully, but I know he made me alive. And that's exactly what Paul or Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, the power that saves you is not your power. It's not your work. It's not what you do. It's not you being good enough, powerful enough, religious enough. It's not you seeking the worldly things that can never satisfy. It is the exceeding power of the Spirit of God that brings life change. And those who have been born again have experienced that. Here's the deal. Those of you who know that, you know it. You're like, yep, that's my story. Now, it's not Mount Eldon, Flagstaff, and a big pine tree, but it's a story just like that. It's a story of the Spirit of God did something in me and challenged me, told me and showed me how I needed to be saved. And I got saved and it wasn't my doing. It wasn't my work. All I know is that something spectacular happened through the power of the Spirit of God. And I'm here today to tell you, I am born again. Not because I did it, but because of the Spirit of God that did something in me. Do not be shocked by this. It's not you, it's him. The true Christians were dead like dry bones and he made them alive. Therefore, I would say this. If you're wondering where you are, here's what you do. Right now, in this moment, in this service, you humble yourself before God and you cry out to him and say, God, move towards me. Do something in me. Show me my lostness. Show me my brokenness. I'm not sure that I've ever been born again. I need that. Spirit of God, do something in my life. Do something in me. And I believe that when you feel the presence of the Spirit, the Spirit washes you and cleanses you from your sin and your holdups and your breakups and all the things that are proud keeping you back. And he and dwells you and changes your life. It's supernatural. If you know, you know, you know. Last thing I wanna show you and we're done. All true Christians are born again Christians because they have recognized the sinner's problem. They have experienced the spirit's power and I have been born again if number three, I believe the son's provision. Verse nine, Nicodemus says to him, how can these things be? It's just kind of like this. I think Nicodemus is at the rooftop feeling the breeze. Maybe some candles are lit on the table, keeping the mosquitoes away or whatever's happening. And he's just like sitting back in his chair. And he's like, how can this be? Like, I just, I, tell me, how is this? Jesus answers him in verse 10. Are you the teacher of Israel? Are you the teacher of Israel? Like, like you, are, you are professor, doctor, reverend, teacher, like this is your, your credentials and your, your, your uh, diplomas are on the wall. You're the teacher that's supposed to give all of the answers about things of God to the nation of Israel and you don't have the answers? You don't know this? Then he says, verse 11, mark it down, ready? Truly, truly, I say to you, we, we is a plural pronoun referencing him and his disciples and John the Baptist. We speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. So we're not pulling things out of thin air and making this stuff up as we go. We're not like closed eyes through the dark, feeling our way through this religiosity and coming up with new ideas. We're telling you things that are actually happening, lives that are being transformed, stories of reconciliation and rebirth and regeneration and cleansing, and you don't believe it. You're not accepting what we say to you. So then if you really are coming to me about heavenly things, but you're not even believing me about earthly things, he says in verse 12, how are you going to believe me about heavenly things? Look, look, man, 
nobody knows the heavenly things like the one who has been in heaven, verse 13 says. And I'm the one who's been in heaven and I'm now on earth. I can tell you these things. And yet you're arguing with me in your heart and mind, telling me how wrong I am. You won't believe the testimony of the spirit of God that is cleansing and renewing. You won't believe all of the things I'm trying to tell you by eyewitness. And and, and you're fighting with me over these earthly things and you want me to tell you heavenly things. Nick, you're missing the point. You're missing the point. The point is not that you need to learn more about heavenly things. The point is that you need to see and experience the salvation of the spirit of God that's taking place right in front of you. And then he says this, I love it. This is his answer. Verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Well, that was out of left field. What the, what, what's going on here? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Well, if you are a student of the Bible or you have any understanding of what's happening here, maybe this is your first time. Just, just know this, that it's a reference back to an event in Numbers 21. In Numbers 21. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, fourth book of the Bible. Numbers 21, the nation of Israel was wandering through the wilderness for 40 years. They were going around this nation of Edom, and they were upset because they had to eat the same old garbage food that God was providing for them. They they probably had an Allison, Ava, Adrian, and Anderson in their midst because they were complaining about what they had to eat. And here they are. They say, why have you brought us up? out of Egypt to die in the wilderness. There's no food and no water and we loathe this worthless food. That was their complaint to Moses. So then the Lord got mad and the Lord sent, verse six says, fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people. Now listen, part of the rite of passage talk, rattlesnakes. You know what we're talking about. So we can relate with this a little bit. Now, I don't know if you've been bit. I hope not, but you've seen them and everybody that comes here is horrified of them because if they bite you, you die immediately, everybody thinks, right? That's what's happening here. I don't know why they were fiery serpents. Were they snakes on fire or were they snakes that were orange and yellow? We don't know, but God was mad at these people. So he sent snakes to bite them and they were dying. So they came to Moses and they said, we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And so Moses prayed for the people and the Lord says to Moses, here it is, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. So there was one serpent made of bronze raised up in the middle of the camp and everybody bit by snakes. All they had to do was believe in the provision of God, which was this this snake made of bronze on a pole in the middle of the village or of of this uh, nation. And if they believed on that and actually looked to that, the Bible tells us that they would be healed and the snake bites would not get them or kill them. And so Jesus says just like that bronze serpent is raised up, the provision of God for salvation from being bit by the judgment of God, they will be saved from that if they look to that, so must Jesus be lifted up. All right, class, pop quiz. Where and when was Jesus lifted up? On the cross. On the cross of Calvary, when he was lifted up, shed his blood, broke his body open and died the innocent for the guilty. And he was lifted up in shame, dying on a tree for you and for me. He was lifted up as a sacrifice, a substitutionary sacrifice for your sin. And Jesus is saying, just as anybody bitten by a snake looks to the bronze serpent to be healed, so anybody who is bitten by sin and under the condemnation and judgment of sin looks to the cross where Jesus was lifted up and they accept the provision that was made for their sin, they will be saved. That's what he said. So how do you be born again? Well, you have your sins taken care of by recognizing or accepting or believing on Jesus Christ who died for your sin. He provided a way of life. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It was a supernatural remedy. It was God's idea. It was a sufficient remedy. It was Jesus, not plus Jesus, anything. 
It was a sure remedy. All who looked by faith, none were lost. It was simple. All you had to do was look. It was a look. It was a, it was, it was a lacking of, or it was a humble look, throwing away self-dependence and self-reliance. Listen to me. Can you imagine being in the camp of Israel? Can you imagine being there? And, and, and you looked you looked to the bronze serpent and you were healed of the snake bite. And then you see this other guy and he's like, man, I got bit by a snake. And you're like, dude, look, there's a bronze serpent right there. Just look. And he's like, no, I'm good. No, I'm good. Oh, it hurts. I'm good. My heart's about to stop. It's missing beats, but I'm good. I don't need that. No, dude, look, really, it's right there. Just look. It's been provided. No, I'm good. I'm going to suck it out. That's a rumor, right? I'm going to suck out the, the poison out of my leg. Or No, I'm good. It's just going to hurt me a little bit. I'm okay. I'm good enough. I'm strong enough. I'm right enough. I don't need his provision. I'm good enough. Can I tell you that every time somebody says that about salvation from their sins, it is as stupid and silly as that? Jesus is the answer for your sins. And just as the bronze serpent was lifted up, so was Jesus lifted up. And he says, all who look to me when I am lifted up, I will save them from the judgment of their sins and the condemnation from their sins. I will save them from the snake bite of their sin and deliver them and heal them. And every time somebody says, no, I'm good, I got this, you are so deceived that you can't even see the reality that judgment awaits you because you're not born again. Born again people, they look to Jesus and they accept and believe the provision of Jesus Christ. I got, I got two points I want to make and, and then we're going to be done. First is this. I don't think Nicodemus knew what was going on. I think Nicodemus is like, what are you talking about, man? Jesus, I, 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 you're cool and I love hanging with you and it's a nice night, but man, you're crazy. But I'll tell you what. That day on Calvary, when he saw the body of Jesus lifted up on a cross, I think Nicodemus' mind ran back to this night because it says that he was there. And he helped Joseph of Arimathea take the body of Jesus down and put him in the garden tomb. You know what I think happened? I think Nicodemus remembered that he was broken. The Spirit of God did something in his heart, a power that was unexplainable and unavoidable, and he looked to Jesus high and lifted up and responded to him in faith. And you know what? One day I'm going to hug the neck of my brother Nicodemus in heaven, I believe, because he's a true Christian, because he was born again. All true Christians are born again Christians. There's no such thing that of a Christian that is a true Christian that is not a born-again Christian. Truly, truly, verse 3, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You have no eternal life. You have no hope of salvation. You have no hope. You have a problem that cannot be fixed by anything other than total transformation and that transformation comes through the cleansing and renewing work of the spirit of God and he drives you to look by faith to the savior lifted up and receive what Jesus did for you when he was lifted up and crucified on the cross as an innocent man for the guilty men Nicodemus came hoping to be taught some things by a great teacher from God <laughs> what Nicodemus received was total transformation Maybe you came thinking, I need to be taught something. I'm, I haven't been to church in a few weeks. I've missed a few lately, and I think I need to fill my tank a little bit. I need to, I'm losing some check marks. I got to check a couple boxes. I need to learn something. Maybe, maybe I'll laugh a little bit. Maybe I'll get a good advice for this depression or frustration I'm going through. Maybe I'll get a new religious teaching that I need desperately. But can I tell you, what you must receive today is not more instruction or more religion. You must receive Jesus Christ and be born again. I hope that that's what happens. Around here, we, we learn so that we can live. We aren't theological fatheads. <laughs> we don't just learn so we can sit around and hypothesize and talk and debate doctrine or get in good talks at the workplace. We come to learn so that we can live. 
And so we always ask a few learning to live questions. And I want to ask you three of them, can I? And these are questions I need you. Listen, I need you to, I need you to lean in a little bit. I need you to lean in a little bit because I need you to ask yourself these questions. I need you to be honest. First question is this. Have I been born again? Have I been born again? You are certain that you have been born physically. <laughs> You're here. You can be certain of this because you are alive. No one here has not been born physically. You are certain of it. And if you cannot say, listen, please, don't, don't tune out. If you cannot say with the same level of certainty that you have been born again spiritually, then I am deeply concerned for your soul and for your everlasting life. You must have an honest conversation with yourself about whether or not you have been born again. Stop lying to yourself and saying it's confirmation, confirmation or association or any of that and come and experience transformation. If you come to the conclusion that you have not been, been born again, then look to Jesus, lift it up. Call on God in humility to show mercy and save your soul. It's glorious. You'll never regret it. You'll know. Salvation is that. Second question is this. What reinforces the Spirit's role in my life? When you get saved, the Spirit of God is the power that initiates and accomplishes that in you. When you are saved, the Spirit of God works in you to confirm that and produce fruit that is evident in your new life. It is important for you to give time and attention to things that reinforce the Spirit's role and work in your life. Things like spending time in his word, letting it saturate your heart and mind. Things like being in personal relationships with other born-again Christians to sharpen you and encourage you. Things like being active in the community of believers, the church, through the rhythms of the local church. Those are all things that the Spirit of God uses to encourage you and challenge you and bless you and confirm that you are born again. These are spirit things that you must enforce, reinforce. So I just want you to ask that question. Last question, and I won't give much explanation to it, but it's this. What part, what part do I play in others being born again? There are dozens or more of people in your life that you see daily and weekly that have been bitten by a snake of judgment called sin, and they will spend eternity in judgment if they don't look to Jesus and be born again, and you might be the voice that's there, that was there in Israel telling a brother, hey, look, the bronze serpent's right there, look, look. Look and be saved. Look and live. It's right there. Maybe you're the one that's saying to that coworker, that friend, that neighbor, listen, I know you're hurting. I know you're broken. I know sin is wrecking your life. And can I tell you, judgment's coming, but look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. And I believe the Spirit of God can and wants to use you in the lives of others to be born again by looking to Jesus and experiencing the power of the Spirit of God. You get that? All true Christians are born again Christians.